All right. Uh, so uh, we are not doing a Thursday night debate breakdown tonight. Um, I actually had one planned, but then I realized that there's a family commitment that is going to uh, prevent that from happening. Um, so I rescheduled with the people that I was going to uh, to do it with. Uh, there is one that is scheduled for next Thursday. In fact, uh, the uh, Twitch streamer people might know, Bastiat, is going to join me, and we're going to pick a Christopher Hitchens debate to watch. Uh, but tonight, unfortunately, I've only got about half an hour, and I know, you know, I know, famous last words that uh, I have said many times at the beginning of streams that uh, this was going to be a really quick one. And then, you know, it's gone for three hours. Uh, I, I see, uh, yeah, I see Silver Harlow uh, say that in the chat. And, you know, the shoe fits. Uh, even, you know, I remember a few years ago, I was teaching this class uh, at Rutgers, Hume Kant in the 18th century. And it got to be like a running joke because I would say it. I always believed it when I said it. Uh, we're probably going to get out early today and the people would just start laughing because they'd heard that before and it, it was never true. We always ended up going like right up to the end, uh, no matter how sincerely I intended to uh, to get out early. But uh, today, uh, if I'm not actually done at 8.30, Jed is going to be in here, you know, dragging me out since, since I really do have a commitment. Um, going to... Uh, Go see a Rolling Stones concert with uh, with Jennifer and and with uh, my mother in law who's in town right now. Uh, so uh, so that is is going to stop me. It was originally going to be in July 2020, and then it got rescheduled for obvious reasons, uh, which is why I forgot that it was tonight until uh, like earlier this week. So uh, in any case, though, uh, figured uh, the main thing I would do tonight is take a few questions. So uh, if you got him, fire up a super chat or just a regular chat, however you want to do it. Um, you know, messenger pigeon, smoke signals, you know, however you could express a question and I will answer uh, on any topic uh, within. Uh, <laughs> I like that, Joe. That's good. Uh, start a debate in the chat so Ben could break it down. Um, so, um, so yeah, so, so fire it up and I'll within reason. Uh, I will answer questions on any topic that people want to throw at me, uh, as many as I can reasonably do within the next 26 minutes uh, before I uh, uh, before I have to go. Uh, yeah, Jay Hutch, uh, what he's bringing up uh, is that on the post game after the regular show uh, with Anna Kasparian on Monday night, in the uh, the post game with with uh, with Jay Andrew World and, uh, and and Jake Appet. Um, we were talking about the recent controversy concerning our friend, Professor Wolf, uh, the, uh, the, you know, Marxist economist. Uh, and, and I said something along the lines of, you know, I think he's wrong about this issue, but you know, I, I think you could say somebody has a bad take, uh, without saying that they're like now your enemy or you just have to write them off, cast them out into the outer darkness, uh, somebody who is much more good than bad can have a bad take from now and again. Who knows? Someday it might happen to me that I'll have a bad take about something. And um, uh, and um, yeah, so um, so I had uh, so I said that, and then you know, it was brought up in the chat that you know that I, I like the the Stones better than the Beatles. Uh, and then uh, Jake and I ended up having like a five minute argument about that. And at the end, I, you know, threatened to replace him, um, you know, as, as, as producer uh, with, uh, with Poochie from the Simpsons uh, was pretty late. So this, this might not have been the most coherent, you know, argument of all time, but there you have it. Um, yeah. Yeah. The stones are still rolling or, you know, not the drummer, but uh, you know, Mick and Keith are, um, I, yeah, first time for me actually seeing them, uh, although I sort of did, in, when I was in high school, they did a concert at Michigan State, you know, I grew up in East Lansing and, you know, didn't have tickets, but, you know, could hear them from the uh, from the front yard. Uh, Munda says, is it Bastiat, not apologetic lib? Yeah, his politics are not my politics, but, you know, he's always, he's an interesting guy to talk to. And, um, you know, I'd gotten him watching some other Hitchens debates, so, you know, we thought it might be fun to do this. Uh, I've, you know, um, you know, I talked to lots of people who I disagree with much more than I disagree with him. 
All right. Um, so let's see. While we are waiting for some other questions, um, I will uh, take the opportunity to uh, to plug a couple of things. Uh, so uh, just as a reminder, uh, the I am uh, so I mentioned uh, Hitchens, the Hitchens book. Yeah, here we go. That's it. Beautiful cover by J. Andrew World is coming out at the end of December. Um, so New Year's Eve is the official release date, although depending on where you order it from, it might not come quite then, but you know, shouldn't be too much later. So if you do get on New Year's Eve, as I've said before, you can um, uh, you can, you know, glance through it real quick before you go out to a New Year's Eve party and when you're all hung over. Uh, the next day, which is probably the best state of mind to read about Christopher Hitchens anyway. Uh, you can actually read the book. Uh, let's see. All right, questions. Um, uh, Jay Hutch says, the interest of full disclosure, my first concert without parents was Save the Stones at the Sky Dome in 1997. That may have been the same tour as the as the one where I did not see them, but sort of heard them in East Lansing. Um all right, question from 255 AD. Oh, yeah, first JB uh, gets all of the extra credit points for saying obviously the Stones are better than the Beatles, RIP Charlie Watts. Uh, strongly agreed, obviously. Um, <laughs> uh, Sir Aka Vulcan says Hitchens would have loved to, well, yeah, he says live, but loved uh, to see. Hillary lose again in 2016? Yeah, maybe. Although I don't think he would have been happy about her losing to Trump. Um, I, I think he would have had no sympathy whatsoever for Hillary, especially when when he when Hillary said in the primary debates with Bernie that Bernie said that uh, Henry Kissinger was a trusted friend and advisor. Uh, no matter how Hitchens' politics might have changed if he lived for another five years, I can't imagine a version of him that didn't despise Henry Kissinger after the book that he wrote about Kissinger's war crimes and lies and involvements and, you know, coups, coups around the world and all of that stuff. Um, but uh, so I, 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 and, you know, he certainly hated Hillary Clinton. You know, if you read his book, No One Left to Lie to, uh, the uh, values of the worst family about Bill and Hillary. Uh, and he would have hated her even more when she said the Kissinger thing. But he also hated Trump, but I suspect he would have hated Trump even more in 2016 than he had before. Um, you know, there are a few comments he made, you know, about Trump, you know, being a billionaire, you know, lunatic narcissist. And uh, I think he said once that the only impressive thing about Donald Trump was they had found a way to cover 90% of his skull, 10% of his hair. But I think in 2016, when uh, Trump was running on these, like, you know, the America first slogan, which he was lifting from, you know, like right wing isolationists who maybe thought that Hitler wasn't that bad in the 30s. Um, yeah, I, I think Hitchens would have really, really, really hated Trump as a candidate. Uh, whether he could have brought himself to vote for Hillary or not, you know, is is a separate question. I have no idea, but uh, but it would have at least complicated it for sure. Um, let's see. Okay, yeah, question. Uh, 255 AD asks, in Graeber's final book, he argues that you can conclude uh, hunter-gatherer societies are better than Western civilization because people who live to both generally prefer the former. Thoughts on that logic? It's actually funny that you ask about this. So last week, um, the reason I couldn't do a Thursday night debate breakdown then was that I was at this conference in uh, in, in Virginia. Uh, it was co-hosted by the uh, the Hannah Arendt Center at Bard College and the Mercatus Institute. Mercatus is a libertarian I think think tank isn't technically accurate because it's associated with the university. And so there are certain political things they can't do, but think tankish entity. So it was me and Hadas Tier, uh, who's a another Jacobin person. She's the author of uh, a good book about uh, sort of presenting classical Marxist economic theory in a very accessible way called People's Guide to Capitalism. So it was the two of us and then two libertarians from the Mercatus Institute doing this weekend of panels on capitalism and alternatives to capitalism and housing and education. And um, there were a bunch of students who came and attended. And at the end of the alternatives to capitalism panel, one of the uh, organizers of this conference, this guy from, from the Hannah Arendt Center at Bard, 
uh, asked pretty much this question, right? Like he quoted the stuff that Graeber quotes in his final book, or I think it's a co-written book, uh, where he talks about like various people like Benjamin Franklin, I think say that people who'd been, you know, kidnapped by um, indigenous tribes uh, who, you know, who had this kind of primitive communist uh, in, in the sense in which Morgan and Marx use that phrase, a uh, sort of social organization who then like were recovered, like wanted to go back, you know, because they preferred that. Whereas indigenous kids, you know, who'd been taken and, you know, raised, uh, you know, and, and raised for a few years uh, by, by settlers also wanted to go back. Uh, and, uh, and yeah, I mean, I think that is interesting. Uh, I'm not quite sure how much to conclude from that. You know, like, you know, it seems like Graeber's conclusion is about this sort of like anarcho-communist vision of how society should be organized. And I could probably in some sense get behind the vision, right? Like the, the point that like G.A. Cohen is making in his book, Why Not Socialism, uh, which you can see behind me. And also, man, I cannot help myself, uh, did not get to this plug before, but I am teaching a, a course uh, at Speakeasy in December um, on that book and also uh, Jason Brennan's Libertarian Reply, Why Not Capitalism? So that's going to be the first three Sundays in November. Uh, link is not in the description for this video, but I'll edit it and put it in. So these are the two books. And in the original, the Cohen book, uh, you know, his his point is that he's got this sort of extremely egalitarian kind of non-market, you know, vision of what uh, justice would be. He talks about this bourgeois quality of opportunity, which is the idea that the only kind of quality that really matters is that there aren't like legal impediments to you trying to, you know, get ahead in society. Uh, and then there's what he calls left liberal equality of opportunity, which is the idea that, um, you know, which is basically bourgeois equality of opportunity plus, right? Left liberal equality of opportunity says, okay, we recognize that there are some social impediments to advancement and we'll try to compensate for them with things like Head Start programs so we can have like real equality of opportunity. And then there's what Cohen calls socialist equality of opportunity, uh, which in certain sense is not too far away from like what Marx talks about a critique of the Gotha program from each to each uh, and, um, and probably does align to a certain extent with the kind of um, anarcho-communist ideals that somebody like Graeber would have. Uh, which, you know, are all about um, saying that, uh, you know, you shouldn't have like some people, you know, some people shouldn't have more than others just because, you know, they sort of luck into it or they have um, or, or they just happen to have certain skills that, you know, given society might reward uh, whether we're talking about like the sort of skills that would be rewarded in a society that's run by like a warrior caste or whether we're talking about the kind of skills that would help you rise through the ranks of like the professional managerial classes in a complex corporate capitalist society. Uh, since, of course, those skills are unequally distributed, uh, you know, Cohen would say that's not real equality of opportunity in that third sense, socialist equality of opportunity, if your horizons are limited by that. Under socialist equality of opportunity, the only the only sort of acceptable inequalities of outcome would be inequalities of outcome that are based on different people just making different choices about work-life balance, how much they feel like working as opposed to leisure, uh, that those would be the only things that would result in uh, in inequalities. This, you know, so that's a very demanding ideal, and Cohen is the first to admit that probably right now, logistically, we don't know how to organize a complex society in ways that would completely accord to that ideal. We probably do need various kinds of incentives for various kinds of things. Uh, so he calls that an engineering problem and why not socialism? And um, so, I mean, as to the question of whether, you know, like the sort of thing that people like Benjamin Franklin were observing would quite be true now, right? Would I prefer to live in a sort of hunter-gatherer anarcho-communist society than I would in a um, high-tech society with a complex division of labor and all of the, the sort of material benefits that come from that, um, you know, that, that we have, um, you know, that, um, you know, all of this infrastructure that takes to produce books and, you know, I don't know, fast food open at various times of night and all of those conveniences. I don't think so. I mean, it could be that to, to really test it, 
uh, I mean, I might if I were in desperate enough circumstances in this society, but, um, you know, I guess to really test it, I'd have to be kidnapped by that tribe and, uh, and see if I liked that better. But lacking that, I think the Cohen point is a fair one, you know, that it accommodates the part of Graver's point that I agree with, which is that, look, for now, we might need a state for certain things. We might even need markets for certain things. Um, certainly, we probably need incentives for certain things that, you know, even within a worker cooperative, there are some incentives that you might need either to, you know, pay people a little bit more because their jobs involve more responsibility and people wouldn't take that on if you didn't get those material benefits or require staying at school for more years. Or on the opposite end, in a more egalitarian society where nobody was driven just by economic desperation to take really like dirty or dangerous or undesirable jobs, you might have to pay people more to be willing to do uh, those things. Uh, so, you know, like in a, in a better society, you know, nobody would agree to be an essential worker during a pandemic unless you actually paid them more than white collar workers got. Uh, so all of those though are sort of practicalities. I think Cohen's point would be that our North star should be, that kind of socialist equality of opportunity. You should get as close to that as you reasonably can, given all these other constraints. And that much I could probably go along with. All right, let's see. Uh, Strom McCollum. Uh, by the way, Strom, I started to read your thing about class reductionism. I didn't get through very much of it, but what I read looked sounded interesting. Um, so uh, I probably agree more than not about what you're saying with that. But uh, Straub McCollum says, have you entertained the idea of debating an alt-right pseudo-anti-capitalist like Eric Stryker or Keith Woods? I do not know a lot about these guys. And I, I would have to kind of look into them before I answer that. I mean, I, I hope that doesn't sound evasive. It's just like, I, I, I don't want to sort of commit myself, you know, sight unseen. Um, maybe. Right. Um, I think the question with that is like, if we're talking about people who are like really creepy alt-right weirdos who might already be super marginal, then it might, you know, not be worth it. Right. Like, like, like if it might actually, there might actually come to a point where you'd be doing them a favor, you know, by doing that. And if so, I wouldn't want to do that, but I am generally all in favor of debating right-wingers who, who misleadingly use, economically egalitarian rhetoric while not actually supporting any of that shit, you know, just as a way of like demonizing immigrants or whatever. I mean, in some ways that's what I was kind of trying to do with the Charlie Kirk debate. All right. Nick says, uh, do you have any thoughts about the random let's go Brandon? Meet? Yeah, it's fine. I mean, it's, it's fine. I, I, I think that freaking out about it, honestly, this is a really overused term, but I think freaking out about it feels very carrot to me. Um, you know, so my understanding of, of that is that, like, there was some NASCAR thing where people were chanting, you know, fuck Joe Biden, and the announcer misheard or pretended to mishear that as let's go Brandon. And so that's what it's like a sort of jokey reference to. It's fine, right? I probably don't, you know, I'm sure that the reasons they dislike Joe Biden have very little overlap with the reasons that I would. And, uh, you know, and, and they're, they're definitely attacking him for the wrong direction. But, like, whatever, it's fine. It's It's kind of... Honestly, as as far as like right wing meme memery goes, it's like downright charming compared to the kind of thing they usually do. So, um, you know, it, at worst, it's a little dumb. At most, it's like almost clever. It's you know, I, I I think that getting mad about it is is not a hill that I'm particularly interested in dying on. All right, um, yes, Straub says I think we need to reach. So I guess this is about the Eric Striper and all that. Yeah, again, I think, I mean, part of this is just an empirical question, like how much you're worried that they actually are going to win over lots of people to the extent that you are, that is a reason to debate them. So, you know, maybe. Um, yeah, right, exactly. Uh, that was my impression too, that Graeber is mostly giving examples from before the mid 20th century, which I think makes it a more complicated trade-off now <laughs> that like the greater level of equality in those societies might be better, but the crazily lower level of technological development might still make it less desirable. Uh, where does logic come from? Allah, praise be his name. Um, yeah, we actually did a poll about that, you know, that we, we read the results on TMBS. Uh, I remember Allah was, I think, the winner. Uh, other options were the balls, and I don't remember. There were a few others. All good stuff. Uh, yeah, it's, a, it's such a weird question, right? Where does it come from? I, I don't really know what that means. 
right? Where does the study of logic come from? Where does like the fact that, you know, certain things objectively are in this relationship to other things where if you believe this, it's inconsistent not to believe that come from. That seems a little bit like asking where the number three comes from. It's uh, not clear to me, at least that's a meaningful question. Uh, how did Hitchens react to the 2008 COG, COG crisis? Had his economic philosophy also gone to hell after 9-11? Not nearly as much as his foreign policy views. You know, he did write a few sort of vaguely populist things about it, sort of vaguely left populist. Uh, it is true that he pretty much, he'd given up on socialism. Like, like I think there's actually a 2005 interview. Uh, I hadn't seen this when I was writing my book, uh, but I, I just guess I saw it after where he says that if he believed, that, so if he still believed that socialism was realistically on the table, he would support it. He was sometimes a little ambivalent about that, you know, but like certainly as of 2001, we wrote letters to him contrary and he'd given up on the belief that it was realistically on the table. That said, uh, I, I think it, he did write a few things after 2008 that were of the sort of general vein, um, you know, fuck oblivious rich people who don't see why this is a problem in a sort of very classy Hitchensy way, right? Like he, he, uh, I, I remember one of these articles, he quoted um, George Orwell, like George Orwell's war diaries. You know, Hitchens really loved Orwell, where um, Orwell had quoted uh, this British aristocrat, Lady Oxford, talking about the Blitz, you know, during World War II, uh, where she said, well, most people have had to move out of town and let go of their staff and live in hotels. And, you know, and Orwell circled the most people and said that nothing is ever going to convince uh, these people that the other 99% of the population exists. All right. Um, Joe says, hot take, that Hitchens would have gotten cool again during the 2016 primary. Despite everything, I can't imagine him seeing a socialist versus Clinton, deciding to vote for Clinton. Yeah, I think that's right. I think the range of options go from absolute worst case scenario, he would have just been neutral or pox on both their houses. But I actually think there's a good chance that he would have, you know, despite all of the extreme missteps in his politics uh, starting in 2001, I actually think there's a very good chance that he would have supported Bernie anyway. I mean, obviously it's unknowable, but I think there's a good chance. Uh, let's see. Uh, as a novelist by the name of Daniel Quiz, written good books on this. Um, yeah, I'm just not familiar. Uh, <laughs> thank you for that, uh, Champagne Humanist. Um, about the bookshelf. Uh, let's see. Um, yeah, exactly, Silver. It'd be nice if we could repeat that experiment with fridges, microwaves, heat, and air conditioning grocery stores and see if it goes the same. Which, of course, the idea that wouldn't necessarily go the same is actually a pretty orthodox Marxist view that, you know, Marx talks about how um, without a high level of material development, you know, communism is just the, you know, equal distribution of scarcity and that's no good, right? Um, so, um, you know, and I think maybe in small groups like hunter-gatherer tribes, uh, you know, it might not be so bad, although, you know, there are obviously very bad things that go with it. But, um, you know, in large groups, it's it's tricky, you know, because, um, you know, it, if you don't have material incentives to get people to work in the ways that you want them to, you know, there's always the, the risk of, backslide into something worse than capitalism so um anyway complicated argument but uh let me just see if i can work at another couple questions in the last four minutes uh yeah 255 ad says uh, they'd rather live in a hunter-gatherer tribe than a 1790 city that's plausible right uh, of course whether you'd rather live in a hunter-gatherer tribe or in a 2021 city, especially if you weren't at the absolute bottom of, of the sort of, you know, pure, you know, reverse pyramid of economic misery is a, a very different question. Uh, let's see. Uh, to do. Uh... <laughs> Uh, good friend Ryan Lake uh, asks, are you ready to admit that Charlie Kirk's solution to the youth fraud dilemma is correct? No, I'm ashamed to admit that I, I still, um, my mind hasn't expanded enough that I can understand how his solution works. 
Uh, so, you know, maybe at some point in the future, I'll be more enlightened and, and, and get that. Uh, let's see. Uh, yeah, Antonio says, if you think it's overused, take care of Uh Let's see. Let's see. Um, doo -doo -doo. <laughs> Silver says, as John said in the damage report, come on, we're adults. You can just say, fuck Joe Biden. It's okay. Heck, heck we say it on the left all the time. Yeah. Um, doo -doo -doo. <laughs> Antonio says, three comes from your mob. Straub says, logic comes from Jesse Lee Peterson. Uh, Gene Jade, uh, wow, Gene Jade, uh, says, uh, have you heard Hitch's brother speak? He's a conservative Christian. I have, in fact. Not only have I heard him speak, I have talked to him. Uh, last week's patron episode of GTAA, last Saturday, uh, was my conversation with Peter Hitchens. It was a crossover with the uh, popular podcast that David Slavic, who um, that's still a name that I could never hear without thinking of Michael saying, and David Slavic roaming the digisphere, you know, when he was at the beginning of TMBS episodes. But David Slavic and James Smith have this podcast called The Popular Podcast. I did this crossover episode with them, and we released it to both Patreons, the popular podcast, and GTA, as patron episodes, and probably be unlocked at both places sooner or later. Uh, interviewing Peter Hitchens is a fun conversation. I mean, he's crazy conservative. Uh, like, you know, actual quote from Peter Hitchens. Oh, I suppose you think Thatcher was a conservative. Uh, but, you know, he's, he's, a, he's a good writer, and he's a really interesting guy, right? So unironically, my favorite insanely right-wing Christian, uh, you know, writer. Uh, not that that's a big category of favorites for me. Uh, you know, I, I I did quote to him what Christopher says about him in his memoir, H22, where he said that Peter's book, The Broken Compass, uh, contained assertions so reactionary that Christopher felt the need to wear a, um, a necklace of garlic uh, to uh, to read it. And I, I quoted that to Peter and he said, and he laughed. So at least he has a sense of humor about it. Um, let's see, um, do, 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 yeah, exactly. It sounds like, right. That was one of my favorite moments from the Charlie Kirk debate when he said, uh, that sure, anybody could start a business as long as you, you know, you know, as long as you're willing to take that risk, you know, get a second mortgage on your house, which of course assumes that everybody owns a house and has good enough credit, uh, not only owns the house, but has good enough credit to get the, uh, that second mortgage. Um, yeah, Bernie Bro Hitchens. I think it's possible if we could look into that Rick and Morty device and, you know, watch, uh, you know, CNN and C-SPAN, uh, from alternate timelines, you know, maybe we'd see somewhere we got that Hitchens. I hope so. Uh, <laughs> JC says, asking where logic comes from would be an odd way back into the Kalam cosmological. I actually, I will say, uh, I haven't done a lot of debates about stuff like this before because I'm very much not, you know, I'm a very unmilitant atheist, but I would love to do a debate with William Lloyd Craig about the Kalam cosmological argument. I think that'd be tons of fun. If anybody has any idea how to hook that up and make it happen, you know, please, you know, send me a message, you know, through the website or Twitter or whatever. Uh, I, and I, I would really enjoy that. Um, What did Hitchens think about the possibility of fascism rising up eventually in the absence of possible socialism? I mean, he was often very worried about fascism. Uh, I think sometimes in kind of a hyperbolic way, honestly. Um, but I think he was just holding out hope that sort of robust liberal democracy at least would, you know, would be enough to stop that, which is obviously something that the younger, more Marxist Hitchens probably would not have thought. Uh, let's see. Wow, did not know that. Gene Janae says, during the desert storm, the rich fled London because Saddam Hussein threatened to scud London. Did the people think he had missiles in that range? Who knows? Um, okay, yeah. London was at the extreme range of scud missiles. That is interesting. Would not have guessed that. Um, doo -doo -doo. Um, yeah, Thomas Paine wrote a lot about how the average person was worse off under modern society. Of course, to connect the dots... Thomas Paine was one of Hitchens' big heroes. Uh, he wrote a book about him. Um, he, uh, I think he was actually on a jury that awarded our friend Harvey Kay an award for, for, for 
Harvey K's uh, Thomas Paine book. Uh, Harvey has a quote on Hitch's Thomas Paine book. Uh, and and yeah, I will say it's a very late Hitchens, right? So this is like the worst version of Hitchens politics, but he does still praise um, he does still praise T- Payne for being a, a sort of proto advocate of a redistributive welfare state. All right. Um, what's your opinion on currently active Maoist insurgencies in places like the Philippines? I don't know that much about them. I mean, I think Maoism is pretty much bad news in terms of you know extreme authoritarianism and abuses that you know that that you know give socialism a bad name. Does that mean there aren't necessarily places in the world where it might be the lesser evil, you know, separate question, but also I'm not going to pretend that I know more than I do about um, the insurgency of the Philippines. Uh, let's see. To do, um, not to get too personal. Trust me, this isn't too personal. What music are you listening to for relaxation these days? Um, you know, it varies. I mean, I'll, I'll do, um, you know, I mean, the stuff that sort of the, you know, the main stuff that I listen to, you know, I mean, obviously the big classic rock and sort of stoner metal, you know, and like classic blues, you know, Robert Johnson, stuff like that. But, you know, various things will come up at various times. You know, went through a while, while ago where I was sort of rediscovering of Montreal, who I used to listen to all the time um, and, and listen to some of those, those albums again. Uh, lately, I don't know. I, I actually, I, I started listening to the uh, Hillbilly Moon Explosion um you know who i'd never heard before you know and I, I have enjoyed them uh all right yep silver is exactly right says uh <laughs> jc says i uh, apologize my initials mentioned in kalam were misleading but i'm an atheist right that is funny that didn't even occur to me about the initials but silver is right i am four minutes over time i do need to go to the concert thank you guys this was a lot of fun uh, I do want to just preview before I go on Monday uh, for the philosophy segment, uh, Jennifer and I, assuming she's feeling better, are going to be talking about uh, Ben Shapiro's critique of, of Kant uh, and the categorical imperative and the uh, right side of history. But the main guest is going to be Slavoj Zizek. Uh, and, um, and we're going to try to drill down a little bit about what Slavoj means by communism uh, always really fun to talk to him. I uh, hope people check that out. Um, but um, <laughs> uh, yeah, I like Charlie Patton. But anyway, I really do need to go. So uh, we are going to leave it there for uh, for tonight. Uh, thank you, everybody. This is a lot of fun. Uh, consistently the, the best chat stream in left media. Left is best. <laughs>